just allow your experience to be as it is from moment to moment without any impulse to change it in any way. In particular, if there are thoughts, don't try to silence or still your thoughts. Just allow your thoughts to go wherever they want. This suggestion might conflict with other forms of meditation that some of you have previously practiced, in which there is a controlling or directing of the mind. Nothing wrong with those forms of meditation, but just put those practices on one side. Simply allow your mind complete freedom. Likewise, if there are unpleasant emotions or feelings, don't do it. Don't feel that they are wrong, that they should be changed into more positive feelings. Just let them be exactly as they are. Having said that, if you are physically uncomfortable or in pain, then it is perfectly natural and legitimate to ease the discomfort of the pain. So feel free to move and make yourself as comfortable as possible. Be sure to include the full spectrum of experience, our so-called internal experience, thoughts, images, feelings, memories. sensations of the body and our so-called external experience, that is, perceptions of the world, the sound of my voice, the, the sight of this room if your eyes are open. Just allow experience to be exactly as it is. That's how experience is being already, so this should not require any effort.
notice that all experience is known. When I use the word knowing, I want to be clear about the way I use the word knowing. I don't mean knowing in a conceptual way. I mean knowing in the sense of simply experiencing. A newborn infant knows its experience without uh, having any idea what it is experiencing. So I use the word knowing in the sense of being aware of. We may not know exactly what we are experiencing, but whatever we are experiencing, we are knowing it, we are aware of it. Just check this in your experience. Allow your attention to range freely over the entire spectrum of your experience. And see that whatever you encounter, you know it, you are aware of it. thoughts, those thoughts are known. It makes no difference whether the thoughts are true or false, kind or unkind. In both cases, in all cases, the thoughts are known. If feelings are present, it makes no difference whether those feelings are, or emotions are pleasant or unpleasant. We may be newly in love, we may be deeply depressed. In both cases we are aware of those feelings. In this way, see that knowing or being aware accompanies all experience. Ask yourself the question, 
does any element of experience other than pure knowing or being aware remain consistently present throughout all experience. any of you ever had a thought, feeling, sensation or perception that was continuous, that didn't at some point come to an end? see in this way that the objects of experience are continuously appearing and vanishing. When I speak of the objects of experience, I don't just mean physical objects, I mean any experience that has some objective quality or feature to it such as a thought, an image, a feeling, a sensation, a sight, a sound, a taste, texture or smell. All of these I refer to collectively as objects or the objects of experience. See that one element of experience alone remains continuously present, that is, knowing or being aware. As such, knowing or being aware is the continuous or, more accurately, ever-present background of all changing experience. Just check that statement in your own experience. Sometimes I refer to the experience of being aware. And by this I do not mean to imply that being aware is an experience amongst other experiences. It is not an experience in the sense that a thought a sound, a sensation, is an experience. We could call it a non-objective experience, the only element of experience that doesn't have any objective qualities to it. It 
which is only due to the limitations of language that I refer to, the experience of being aware. But the reason I refer to the experience of being aware is that being aware is our experience. If I were to ask each of you now, are you aware? You would all pause and I hope you would say yes. In that pause, you, as it were, go to the experience of being aware. In other words, you cease being aware of your thoughts, feelings, sensations and perceptions and you become aware of being aware. You experience being aware. In other words, the experience of being aware is not unknown, it is known. It is our experience that I am aware. And it is in this sense that I refer to the experience of being aware. Even though being aware or pure knowing has no objective qualities. common name in spiritual circles for pure knowing or being aware is awareness or consciousness. First of all, I use these two words, awareness and consciousness, synonymously. Some expressions of non-duality make a distinction between these two words. But in our meetings, these two words will mean ex refer to exactly the same non-objective experience. Uh, referring to pure knowing or being aware as awareness or consciousness tends to reify or objectify the non-objective experience of being aware. Again, this is simply a limitation of language. All words are designed to describe the objective content of experience. We have no language for the non-objective experience of being aware. So we have to do the best we can. With words that were not designed to refer to the experience of being aware. So please, when I use the word awareness or consciousness, don't allow yourself to objectify the experience of being aware. Make sure that these words don't refer to some abstract experience that some people have and others don't, that sometimes you know and sometimes you don't. Make sure that it always relates to the simple, obvious, intimate, direct experience of simply being aware. other name for pure knowing or 
being aware in common parlance, that is in, in circles that, that outside the spiritual or non-dual community, is I. I is the word that everybody uses to denote that which knows or is aware of their experience. Everybody says, I know my thoughts. I am aware of my feelings. I perceive the world. As such, I is the common name that we give to pure knowing or being aware. When I say pure knowing, I mean knowing that has no objective content, no objective qualities to it, just empty knowing. Whatever it is that knows our thoughts is itself inherently free or empty of all thoughts. Whatever it is that is aware of our feelings and sensations is itself prior to all feeling and sensation. Empty of all feeling and sensation. Whatever it is that knows our sights, sounds, tastes, textures and smells is itself prior to, empty of, free of all seeing, hearing, tasting, touching and smelling. It is, as such, sometimes said to be empty. Empty in this context just means empty of objects, empty of objective content. It doesn't mean a blank, empty, nothing or a void. It is full of pure knowing, full of awareness but empty of objects. So this pure knowing or empty awareness is that we refer to as I is our essential irreducible self. When I say our essential self I refer to that element of our self that is that cannot be removed from us, that is always with us. No thought, image, feeling, perception, activity or relationship remains continuously with us. <coughs> Only the experience of being aware remains continuously with us. In fact, it doesn't remain with us as if it were one thing and we are, were another. It is 
what we essentially are. And when I say it is our irreducible self, I mean that we cannot go further back in our experience than being aware. Everybody, not just those of us that are, those relatively few of us that are interested in non-duality, but all seven billion of us have the experience of being aware. In other words, we all experience ourselves. But not everybody experiences themselves clearly as they actually and essentially are. In almost all people's experience, what they essentially are, pure knowing or being aware or awareness itself, is mixed, mixed with and therefore seemingly qualified by what we are aware of. In other words, in most people's experience, their essential self of pure knowing or awareness itself is mixed with the qualities of our thoughts, images, feelings, sensations and perceptions. In other words, we experience ourselves as an amalgam of awareness plus thoughts, feelings, sensations and perceptions. And this amalgam of awareness and objects is what we call the separate self, or ego, or finite mind. That is why when we, we ask most people, who are you? Or, what are you? They will say, well, I'm a man or a woman, I have such an age, a, a particular nationality, I live here, I, this is my profession, etc. But our age, our profession, our nationality, even our gender, our marital status, our profession, our thoughts, none of these are essential to us. Only one element of experience is essential to us. And therefore only one element of experience qualifies for the name I. Each of us has been calling ourselves I all our lives. And that the I that we refer to is always the same I. Do you not feel that you are the same person, the same I, now, as you were at breakfast this morning, or during your journey yesterday? Do you not feel that the person or self or I that you are now is the same self 
that you were last year or ten years ago or forty, fifty, sixty years ago. In other words, the name I refers to that which we continuously are, that which remains ever present in our experience. Well, the only element of experience that remains continuously present is being aware. And being aware is always the same experience. The experience of being aware now is exactly the same as the experience of being aware was when we were having breakfast, when we were traveling yesterday, last year, ten years ago, when we were five-year-old girls and boys. The experience of being aware is always the same experience. Nothing ever happens to it. It has no age, it has no gender, it has no form, it has no shape, it has no size, it has no nationality. It is not qualified by any particular thought or feeling. So the first step we take in this approach is to extricate what we essentially are from everything that is superfluous to us until we arrive at our essential, irreducible essence. Most people are so exclusively fascinated by the content of their experience, their thoughts, memories, feelings, activities, relationships, perceptions, that they overlook or ignore the experience of being aware. And this ignoring of the experience of being aware is what is referred to in the Vedantic tradition as ignorance. Ignorance, in this sense, doesn't mean stupidity, as it does in common parlance. It just means the ignoring or overlooking of ourself, the forgetting of ourself. the ignoring of ourself in favour of objective experience. In the Western tradition it is called, this ignoring or forgetting of ourself is called the fall. Or it's what's referred to by the word sin. As a result of this 
ignoring or forgetting of ourself. Our essential self seems to be missing. And it is for this reason that if we ask most people to describe their experience, they will simply describe a series of objects, thoughts, images, feelings, relationships, etc. But most people who describe their experience in this way In other words, most people that have ignored or forgotten their essential self will also find that they are almost always in a state of lack, or agitation or unhappiness. And as a result of this, sense of lack or agitation, they venture out into the realm of objects, seeking to unite with an object, substance, person, activity, in order to ease the pain of this sense of lack. In other words, most people engage a a great search in the realm of objects for peace and happiness. None of us would be here today if that search had not, to a greater or lesser extent, failed us. great secret that is contained in all the religious and spiritual traditions is the understanding that the peace and happiness for which all people long can never be delivered by a objective experience and can only be found in the essence of ourselves, can only be found in the depths of ourselves. great equation, which is the summary of the entire Vedantic tradition, Sat, Chit, Ananda, meaning Sat meaning being, Chit meaning awareness, Ananda meaning peace or happiness. This great equation simply means the knowing of our own being, as it is, is the experience of peace and happiness. To know ourselves as we truly are is happiness itself. So when most people hear this, they join a spiritual organization or they attach themselves to a guru or they learn some meditative
technique and they embark on another great search. The search for themselves. The search for what they now conceive to be enlightenment. Enlightenment in this context is understood to be the ultimate experience. And many people spend years searching for enlightenment just as they previously spent years searching for happiness in objects. But sooner or later even that search frustrates them. The reason why the search for enlightenment frustrates us is because we conceive of enlightenment as the ultimate experience. The ultimate experience that we might one day attain if we practice hard enough and long enough, that will finally deliver the happiness that we failed to find in objective experience. In fact, I would, I suspect that most people who are here are here not only because the conventional search for happiness in objects has failed you, but also the less conventional search for enlightenment has also failed you. Enlightenment is not an experience. It is not the ultimate experience. Enlightenment is simply the recognition of ourselves, not as we might be if we practice hard enough and long enough. But as we are now, if we see ourselves clearly. Any experience that comes to us at a certain point in the future will, by definition, leave us. Has anyone here ever had an experience that appeared at some moment in their life and that didn't disappear at another moment? If you are seeking enlightenment in some future experience, you are destined for misery. Make no mistake about that. If you are seeking enlightenment in some element of experience that is not present now, you will be forever disappointed. is one of the most 
misunderstood terms in the entire spiritual repertoire. Enlightenment is simply the recognition of ourselves as we truly are now, not how we might become. It has absolutely nothing to do with the quality or content of your thoughts and feelings. Changing your thoughts and feelings from negative to positive won't take you any closer to <coughs> enlightenment. In other words, it won't take you any closer to what you essentially are. That is why we don't spend any time in this approach, manipulating, controlling, or directing our thoughts and feelings. We go directly to what we essentially are. That's why it's called the direct path. Now, when I say we go directly to what we essentially are, I don't mean to imply that we are one thing and what we essentially are is another, as we might go directly from here to the dining room, relatively speaking. It's not like that. If I were to ask each of you now, stand up and take a step towards yourself, what would you do? We cannot take a step towards what we are because we are already standing at ourselves. And if I were to ask you stand up and take a step away from yourself, in which direction would you go? We cannot either go towards ourself or away from ourself because we are ourself wherever we are. The common name for the place at which our self stands is here. Have you noticed have you noticed that it's always here? Here is the name we give to that place. It is in fact a, a placeless place where we always stand, not where we, the body, is located in space, but the place where I always am, the place where I, awareness, always am. We cannot go towards that place because we have never left that place. We cannot go towards ourselves because we have never ceased to be anything apart from ourselves, only we have allowed ourselves to become mixed with thoughts, feelings, activities, relationships, etc. So when I say we return to ourselves, that is simply a manner of speaking. We don't return to ourselves. We, awareness, cannot return to ourselves because we, awareness, always are ourself. So the, the phrase 
the return to ourself or the sinking of the mind into the heart of awareness is said as a concession to one who believes and more importantly feels that they have left themselves or forgotten themselves in other words it is said to one who is unhappy to such a one it is legitimate to say you are unhappy or agitated because you have forgotten yourself you do not see yourself clearly return to who you essentially are be knowingly what you always and inherently are and as a result of this suggestion such a person seems to embark on a journey it is not really a journey it is the uncovering the revealing of what we essentially are the word revealing or revelation from the Latin revelare simply means to lay bare a revelation in this context is not a marvelous new experience that some people have and others don't it is simply the laying bare of what we always and essentially are but fail to notice due to our fascination with experience Ramana Mahashi, Jesus, the Buddha were not extraordinary people. They were people just like you and I, just regular people like you and I. The only reason we think they are extraordinary is because none of us ever knew them. So we have abstracted them and projected all our desires for perfection onto these people who died centuries ago. If any of us had lived with Jesus or Ramana Maharshi or the Buddha, we would have been irritated by them <laughs> just as we are irritated by our friends and children and companions of course all those stories of irritation are edited out of the stories that we hear about these people we project onto them an ideal of perfection enlightenment has nothing to do with perfection it is the recognition of our essential being in the midst of all our imperfect experience and nobody has privileged access to their essential being. Ramana Mahashi, Christ, the Buddha, Vatsu, Balayani, none of these people had special access to their being. Some magical thread of connection that we don't have. The experience of being aware is identical in all people. The experience of being aware in Hitler was identical to the experience of being aware in Ramana Mahashi. Their thoughts and feelings and as a result their subsequent activities and relationships were very different. 
but their essential self was the same. In one case, that essential self was not obscured by thoughts and feelings, and in the other case, it was. That's the only difference. And as a result, their activities and relationships were different. Nor is the recognition of our own being something that is extraordinary or difficult. Everybody has the experience, I am. Is there anybody here now who is not having the simple experience, I am? And if we were to ask this question to any of the seven billion of us outside non-dual or spiritual circles, as long as they understood the question, would not all those people answer yes to the question, are you present? Are you aware? Would they not all answer yes? I am. The simple words I am before anything that before anything has been attached to that I am. The simple expression I am is the it is the simplest expression of the knowing of our own being. Because in order to say I am I must know I am. All that is required is to see what the statement I am refers to. To see what I essentially am before what I am is qualified by thoughts, feelings, activities and relationships. That's it. That is what is referred to as enlightenment. Just to see clearly what I am. Ramana Maharshi once said that the statement in the Old Testament I am that I am was the highest formulation of the truth in any spiritual tradition. I am simply the knowledge I am before anything has been added to that I am. In other words, before anything has been added to my essential self-aware being. That is what I am.
And Ramana Maharshi abbreviated that phrase. And he just said, I, I. By which he meant, I am only I am only that which I am. And that is why the name I <coughs> in this uh, tradition, this approach is considered to be the, the sacred name, the holy name, God's Christian name. The highest mantra. And the most intimate prayer. Simply to sound the name I. and allow it to take you to its referent. 